thank you so much for joining us on March's webinar um, as we continue our series of webinars just to help our early years educators and practitioners overcome barriers, improve efficiency and help each other work together through often our challenging times that we find in um, our sector. Um, just to remind you housekeeping rules, um, everybody will stay on mute during the webinar and then when the speakers finish we will ask the questions that you've sent us throughout the webinar or ones that you've sent us privately we'll ask those at the end of the session and as always the recording of the session together with the presentations and contact details of our speakers and anything else that we've discussed that we might find useful they'll be sent out to you afterwards with the recording of the webinar so today we are talking sustainability and how we can future proof our wonderful sector and we have none other than early years expert Juno Sullivan. Um, many of you will know June, she's the chief executive of, of LEAF, the London Early Years Foundation, one of the UK's largest charitable so, um, childcare social enterprises and she currently runs a 14 nurseries across 12 London boroughs, that's no mean feat. Um, this morning, June and her colleague Z will be discussing the concept of sustainability, delving into strategies on how we can sustain our settings and industry as a whole. So we're very excited about this. So without further ado, June, over to you. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Gail, and good morning to the lovely people who've taken time to come and listen to us. Um, it's a um, it's great opportunity to, to talk about sustainability, which is my big thing and has been for quite some time because I'm doing a PhD on it in my spare time. Uh, I think the principle here is anyone working in the early years is never give a busy person something to do because then they just get busier. So the whole issue of sustainability is very interesting because people are very worried by it. And, and it um, it feels like too big a subject to really kind of handle. It feels like, oh, it's, you know, how can we, us, people in the early years do something about the big issues of climate change, which is driven by sustainability issues. And um, but actually, um, we are really right at the heart of it because we are preparing the next generation. And uh, so us understanding about it is pretty important. OK, well, it, look, can you guys see that? Can you can everybody see that? Yep. OK, somebody nod to me. Um, you know, uh, I'm looking at. I think it's Flutara or Flutana. Yeah, thank you. And there's Pippa somewhere I can see. So if you just nod, uh, that's great. Um, so um, Perfect. are you seeing that as a screenshot? Are you seeing the whole thing underneath as well? What are you seeing? We're seeing the whole um, the whole page with you on the left, and then lots of lots of um, pictures with word with fifty uh, fantastic ideas for engaging dads and nursery gardens and sustainability. There's no notes under there that we can see. Jolly good because I really don't want you seeing my notes because my notes be very random. <laughs> 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 so um I'm gonna smooth, smooth swiftly on from that. Um that's um that's how we go. So here we go. So just a little bit about LEAF so you understand. We're a social enterprise. That means we are a social purpose organization and every penny we make is reinvested in what we do. And what we do is we subsidize um more than 35% of our children from um families that are in areas of deprivation or living in poverty who otherwise would not be able to fit or uh, be afford uh, any kind of nursery uh, education or don't fit the criteria, you know, to uh, to access it. So that's what we do. And so obviously sustainability is key to us because the decisions we make are about sustainability in terms of an economic sustainability. So therefore, we're not uh, we don't extract profits to give to um to give to shareholders, we recycle it. So that you, you'll you hear nowadays the language of the what they call the circular economy. So a bit like the circular economy, we recycle the money inside to provide more places for children and to look after the staff as better we can. Um, then my favourites, uh, I think my favourite uh, quote, one, well, one of my many favourite quotes is, if you're thinking ahead, plant a seed. If you're thinking a decade ahead, plant a tree. If you're thinking a century ahead, educate the people. Now that is it, early years. You, we're currently, uh, as you probably all very aware of, um, kind of being sucked into big public policy about expansion plans and about, the, you know, childcare is the answer to the economic issue of getting parents to work and stuff. And so we suddenly find ourselves full and centre in the middle of an economic debate. And that's causing us to have some tensions about, you know, is the money enough and, you know, can we manage and we haven't got enough staff and all the other issues that we deal with on a daily basis. 
But it's interesting, though, it is raising the question of um, early intervention. And the notion that actually what we do with the children makes huge difference to, to, in terms of the way society will be shaped. So I think people are beginning to get that more now. But I think that's really important when we talk about sustainability, because they are the future and they are the glo global citizens. And we do have to kind of understand what we're teaching them in terms of behaviours, in terms of choices they make and in terms of the way they um they live their lives and they take make choices. And of course, like the, you know, you're familiar with the ecological thinking of Bronfenbrenner. You know, you drop a stone in the water and there's a ripple and the ripple is not just the child. The child's right at the heart of it, but there's the family, the community, your staff, your staff's family. You know, you one stone and you are really touching more and more people. And I don't think we often understand that about the power we have. We often think we're just a little small nursery in the corner of somewhere. But actually, we're really powerful because our voice has got real authority and people listen to what we have to say um especially children and they watch us children watch us like a hawk you know they are looking at us all the time everything we do they've spotted it and you know that when you suddenly feel yourself being played out in the corner in the role play area and you think oh my do i really carry on like that you think oh yeah i do or if they start putting plastic gloves on to serve lunch you know that kind of thing and you think what do we do that really we shouldn't be so sustainability therefore matters enormously. And as a big issue, it's also about social justice. So for example, I know like we've all taken to avocados in the last five or six years, you know, that everyone has to have an avocado uh, brunch at some point. We all become American, we all have a brunch. And, and we never, you know, you go and you order your sourdough bread and your avocado and your two scrambled eggs on top or your two poached eggs on top. You don't think about where that avocado came from. But actually, when you start thinking about things like that, you begin to realize there's a there's a there's a kind of a journey. So people often think about this in terms of journeys of uh, how many air miles did it take to get the avocado to to London or to wherever you are. But actually, it's about if you're growing avocados to feed people in the outside of the normal times that avocados grow, what implication has that got on the farmers, you know, 2000, 5000 miles away? So, for example, like if you need more water to grow more avocados out of season, what implication has that on the landscape of, say, Chile, where they grow quite a lot? And then what does it mean for the farmer there? Because he has to pay for water because water is privatised. So therefore, if you have to pay for water to, to, to grow more avocados out of season, how does that unbalance the rest of the seasonal you know, crop? And what does that mean in terms of cost? And, and what does that mean in terms of the farmer's kind of you know, cycle and the biodiversity of that neighbourhood? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't eat avocados. I'm just saying sometimes we're making decisions that we don't really think about because they're far away from us. But actually, that's the kind of thing sustainability is about. So when you're choosing your foods for the nursery, you know, you might decide I don't want anything that's not seasonal. I'm not having mango in the middle of, of the winter because we wouldn't have mango in the middle of the winter in this country because we wouldn't be growing it. You know, you might say I'll have apples and blackberries because that will be kind of seasonal and natural to us. So it's those kind of thinkings I think I want you to kind of kind of consider today and Z will give you quite a lot of examples of what she does as well in relation to some of that because I think sometimes it feels like it's too big an issue but you don't have to do it all but you could do little bits but understanding it is quite important. So if we go to the three pillars then they are really it's, people don't understand I think also that sustainability has three pillars to it it's social it's economic and it's environmental. And social is about how do you engage in your setting? How are you part of your setting? How are you understanding your community and how you connect with your community? How you know what what decisions are you making that builds what Robert Putnam calls social capital, where the children find their space in their place? You know, and for a lot of children, and you know, we're in London, like they're coming in. And they're coming into the city. They're, you know, they're new residents, new citizens. And they're trying to figure out where they, you know, where their place is. To know and to walk around your neighbourhood, to know which, you know, what buses come, to know who is in the shops, to know that the local, you know, the older people, you know, in that particular area or whatever, you know, is really important because it builds social capital and actually creates neighbourhoodness and.
and connection. And so social element of uh, sustainability is really powerful and often misunderstood, but something I think in early years we could be particularly good at. Um, and I think a lot of what you're doing is probably fix into those pillars, but you've probably never blocked them or described them in that way. And I need you to go away and think about things you do that actually are you know, fitting into those pillars quite well. Environmental is the one that we're mostly good at in the sense that we might not be doing it, but we know about things like do not create waste, try and reduce your plastic. You know, we all want to stop standing getting swallowed up in the sea. You know, all of those things are quite important for us, but they're they they're more visible, like growing stuff in the garden. All of those things are quite important. So um, the thing I really like the most is the sustainable goals. So the United Nations, um, they defined these in 2015. There's a whole story around this, but they are very simple to understand. But basically, these are what sustainability needs to look like. So if you look at those, you think, well, these are big stuff for countries designed, you know, to make the, the change the world. But if you look at number one, no poverty. Some of you might be doing something around that. You might be like us, a social enterprise building a, um, you know, offering places free, a lot of places free for children that you subsidize, you cross subsidize. It might be that you have a food bank because you know in your local neighborhood, actually people are struggling. It might be that you provide, you work with a charity, say like Sal Shoes, and you get the children, you know, school shoes because you know that's a problem for the parents. It could be anything, but you're contributing to the no poverty. So it's not like having major policies, you know, major housing policies that the government might have. It's what are you doing? And, 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 you know, these things are, are important in terms of zero hunger. Do you make sure, for example, that some of your children go home having had something to eat because you know they may not get anything when they go? So some of you will probably put in an extra tea or you might have a, a, um, a, a lunch that's at later hours so that some children who would otherwise not be able to eat can eat. All those kind of things. Like we train all our chefs for example, we have a chef academy and we train all the chefs because we noticed that if they understood food portion better, there was less food waste. Now, that's only a small thing, but it makes a difference. And all of those good health and well-being, you know, you look after your staff, quality education, that is our bag. That is what we do. Gender equality. Do you have men working in childcare? You know, those kind of things, it doesn't have to be big policy issues. It can be quite a lot, like clean water and sanitation. We're really hot on water wastage. And so I have trough sinks so that it's less waste for the children. You know, if you have the water bucket, if you have the water tray out, have a bucket underneath it, because inevitably the children will turn the tap off and, and, you know, the water gets wasted. But if you have a bucket underneath it, well, then the water gets into that more easily. You can put it on the plants outside. Right now, we're drowning. I can't, if, I, if there's a many more rain, I think we'll we'll become, you know, we'll be swimming. But in the summer, we'll be crying out for the rain. We'll be saying, oh, I wish there was a bit of rain. Everything is too dry and too hot. And you'll be thinking back with fond memories of how every single day from January to March, we had rain every single day. Um, and you'll be thinking of the sponginess of the garden and the sponginess of, of, the, of the parks. And then you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be sad for it. So again, it's like thinking about all of those things. And the uh, sustainable goals are very good to get you thinking about it. And the most important one in my book is number 17 which is about partnership. It's about how do we get our voice out there so people understand what we're talking about. So 17 is very important because it is about the partnerships and us working together. Um, I just want to show you how we do it. So I'm a bit obsessed by this. So, you know, you don't have to be as obsessed as me about this, but I have created a strategy for the organization. And I have put our work against what we're trying to do against some of those um, sustainable goals. And I have also employed somebody as a sustainable lead. And we have also developed a whole program, at, um, a diploma level four on um, sustainability in the early years, which we wrote during COVID when everyone was miserable and, you know, at the end of the world was nigh. And we were every day going into children who were joyful and who were, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed. And we thought you can't have this negative narrative all the time. You have to be positive. These children are only two and three. You know, they're going to have to find a way through all of this. And so as the consequence of that, we wrote the programme, which Z will talk about in a second because she's one of the graduates. Um, and so therefore, the other thing that I've learned from doing my studies is that if you're going to do sustainability, you can't have it as an add on. It has to be woven into the way you think about things and the conversations you have in terms of your governance. So you have to put like, you know, if you're going to make decisions, you have to 
put them as part of the organizational decision making rather than somebody interested in it trying to persuade you guys to do something like maybe you know not use single use plastic or replace your horrible plastic aprons with you know fabric ones that you can wash and that you use washing machines on the lowest um you know the lowest uh, cycle and you use balls in the in the washing machine to reduce the water etc cetera, etc cetera. um you could become obsessive by the way so i'm i'm not suggesting that either um and then your eco champion is your change agent. So one of the things that is the, the hardest thing and the thing I'm studying the most actually is change. People understanding change. People are frightened by change, even if it's a good change. So you've got to get very brave about how you manage that and not be put off and not take it personally, but understand what I call the seven aces of change. There's like the seven stages of change for the moment you articulate it to the way you adapt it, to the way you anchor it, to the way you amplify it. And anchoring change is the hardest thing for all organizations, whether they're childcare, um, education, big corporates, accountancies, doesn't matter. Everybody tells you that people sign up for the change even and, you know, or even ask for the change and you put it all in place and it doesn't stick. How many of you have said things like, at the end of the day, guys, can we put the puzzles all away? All away. And therefore, we can get rid of that basket of loose loose parts that we have tucked away where you have a bit of puzzle, half a book, a bit of something else left in there. And it's all in this, this bowl because things haven't been put away. And then one day you get fed up with the whole thing and the whole thing goes. And um, that's the kind of thing that we think have to think about when we're starting a sustainability journey. What little steps can we take that make that difference? And then why, why do staff like working in a place that's thinking about sustainability? Our Gen Z um, uh, population are very into all of this. And we the majority of our staff are going to be Gen Z. So we need to understand Gen Z and what kind of motivates them. But they like the idea of sustainability. They are worried about things like um, climate change. They are worried about decisions we're making that actually make climate change a real problem. So they're really interested in that. And so if you're in a, in a world where we've got a recruitment crisis, a continuum, it's not even a crisis anymore, it's just endemic. It's like it's really brilliant to be able to sell to them that you're interested in this and they're choosing decisions um, and they're choosing decisions and they're choosing to make, uh, you know, to make um, active choices about places that are thinking about sustainability. Um, and they're interested in the CPD opportunities on that. And they're interested in being given some freedom to develop some of that stuff. So it's really interesting to understand that because it really helps you in terms of your recruitment and in terms of retention, because it's all very well recruiting the staff in. But if you don't retain them, we're in trouble. And then um, the, what did they don't like about sustainability in the, in the in the workplace? They don't like dividends focused on on um, extraction and sent to um, large, you know, uh, shareholders. They don't like that. They they don't like it if you don't have a clear sustainability strategy. They do, they're very keen on understanding greenwashing, which they see a lot of now because like, every marketeer in the world has talked about, you know, sort of pretending that they're all green and and um, sustainable and actually they're not at all. They don't like waste. And they like things that are ethically sourced. Now, that's a problem for us because you can't always get stuff we want ethically sourced. So we're always having to navigate and to to persuade our providers to do things like working with the hope or hope for developing great actually our TTS because they want to do stuff to make it work if you think about some of the some of you would bought have bought community play things well they use result you know sustainable wood so it's those kind of things are quite important I think in terms of understanding and um and keeping keeping that going um, some of you are asking me about the slides for the seven days of change I'll drop that in and don't worry about these slides I will you will get them. So don't fret, don't fret at all about trying to catch notes and stuff. Here's a good book for you to read. I wrote it with a colleague of mine in 2022. It's called Social Leadership and it's about social purpose. And it's about how you know whole things about how do you develop sustainability in your setting? How do you help people to manage change? So I think um one of this, the little boxes came up there. I think it was Grasnia, and I'm probably saying her name wrong. She asked about the seven A's of change. It's all in that book. So you just have to read that and um, and you'll find everything you need. 
I'm kind of speeding on here because I want to get uh, Z on on to talk to you about reality. And so as an organization, we did all of those things. We appointed a sustainability manager, ex nursery manager, Nick, there he is. Um, we wrote the sustainability strategy, which I've showed you, and I'm happy to, to send you a copy if you're interested. We're rather proud of it, actually. So very happy to, to put the link into that. You can download it from our website. Um, uh, we got accredited for things like uh, Planet Mark and ISO 14001 and uh, Eco Schools, and the green flag, to understand, because sometimes having a set of, um, I suppose, criteria to make you kind of help you focus what you need to do is really useful. And I found that very useful. And then we've got our qualifications, which is a very popular course if any of you want to come on it. It's mostly done online. So it doesn't matter where you are, but we've we've it's full all the time. So it's but it's very popular because, as I say, many of our young staff very, very interested in that. And and that's that's it, you know, um, in summary. And I, again, I'm not going to waste time talking about it because you can read this later. You also can have my email and contact me or come on to me to LinkedIn. I don't mind at all. And we can send you things that you might find helpful as well. And so in, in essence, I would say, you know, your job is to set out your strategy. What I can do at LEAF is different to what you can do in your nursery or your preschool or your childminding setting. You know, you decide and don't beat yourself up. You know, if it's two small steps, it's two small steps. But you need to engage your staff. And that actually proves to be the hardest thing. So understanding that. And what my research is finding, actually, is that dial up on emotion. They really, because it touches them, sustainability has this kind of emotional response on that. It's OK then to use that in a way to kind of help them to make some changes to their practice. Um, normally, we dial down on emotion because we don't want people to be um, kind of locked into that idea. But actually, in this case, dial up on it. It's really interesting. Um, and then um, one of the things we want is a community of practice. We're really keen to get everybody interested in um, in what this means and what this looks like. And if you're interested, uh, there's my email and we'd love to have that. We've got people interested from all over the world and it's a great conversation to be had. So I'm just on this as fast as I possibly can. So Z, where are you? OK, oh, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Jean. Um, OK, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I have been with Elif Nursery for two years in May and I started, I did the course in my first six months with Elif. I've done a self-guiding course and this course came up sustainability and I thought this sounds really interesting. Um, done a 12 week course and I absolutely ran with it. I, I love it. It's just it's just blown me away, totally blown me away. Um, I have learned so much from it. So I have, I've been doing the growing with the children. Now I've always been quite a, a keen um, gardener anyway. So it was something that I was already interested in. Um, and the recycling, I felt that I could personally do a lot more. There was a lot of things that I learned on the course that really benefited me from being able to implement it and, and bring it, really bring it to life and improve my quality of life as well. Um, I've been helping um, the young children and it's, it's all about, we've been doing, I've been really looking at recycling, reusing and what we can do and how we can reuse things. Um, so we have been looking at um, recycling. So I've started off, well, okay. When I've done the course with Nick, uh, Nick, told me about free sourcing. I've never heard that before. I didn't even know what it was. Um, so basically free sourcing is when you can go out into the community, there is so many things that they throw away. I mean, they, they chuck them away every single day and we can use them. And so I've been able to go to um, florists where I've been using old flowers that they would throw away any kind of fabrics or any kind of materials that they have all the flowers petals um so they, they're given to us and we can use them for collages we use them um for to do loads of different things in our nursery i've also been in touch with home base um since doing this and home base which i didn't know in march they actually give away loads of herbs and loads of plants to schools and nurseries they do help the community and they give loads of paints away they've give um rolls of wallpaper 
that we can use in the nursery. There's so many places. Um, I'm also now in the process of getting in contact with other big chains, i.e. Asda, um, Tesco's, Sainsbury's. So I've got to email them and speak to their H HR, but there's loads of things that we can get for free that they throw away on a daily basis. Waitrose, there's so many places that we can get all of these things and start building up a, a relationship and having a community within our centre. So I work in Hackney. So where I'm based is Pembury uh, Nursery. So we're in central London. And there is so many places that really, and once I've told them um, that I'm a sustainability lead, everybody's on board and everybody really wants to help. So um, I'm making so much links through doing this course and actually helping the nursery and also the children are a part of it. So they're growing and actually realizing that how it's important because we all have to play an important part in this planet. And I think if we, um, we do this, it's like, I have, I'm at the moment, I am supporting somebody else in my nursery. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm mentoring her and she felt very overwhelmed take it, doing the course, but didn't know how to deal with it. So um, it's one step at a time. Um, I don't feel intimidated by it because it's something that I've loved. So for me, it's been quite easy for me to just manage it. Um, but I have found um, some of the staff that I am helping along to do this do feel a bit intimidated and they do need, um, like June said, change can sometimes frighten people. And it's been able to understand that and to be able to say it's okay we can just do it a day at a time some people find planting really really intimidating any talk about your planting there? you know like when we you know there was such an on green environment and you came and talk about the the books right. that you love i think the, the, right. the audience love okay. that kind of stuff so, okay so um before i came to Pembury, i went to fire station and they didn't have one plant in that nursery um and it made me so sad so I spoke to Nick and we managed to get some plants and I had this vision in my head and we had a hallway so our building is a fire station so um, it's an actual fire station so um, it's very cold and we had this 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 part where you go into the kitchen but it was just an empty space but it had like um, glass doors and in my head, I visualised a conservatory and I thought, God, it would be an amazing conservatory. And I had it. I could, you know, when you can picture something. So when I got the plants, I got all the tables, I got the tables and I got a nice little chair and I got books for the children and it became a conservatory. And it was like a nice little greenhouse and all the plants. I think June's, yeah. you've seen it, you've got it. Yeah, on that's your, brilliant. Uh, okay. Absolutely. And I just fell in love with it. And from then it just kind of. It grows and this is what's so beautiful about sustainability and so um, from that I started researching books and I was looking for books that I can maybe teach the children so even though we're doing it they're living it that I wanted them to actually be able so I found a woman called Sarah Roberts she's amazing but she, unfortunately she's only written two books so I've been looking on Amazon and still trying to hope, hopefully praying that she do another book, do another book. And then I thought, OK, do you know what? I'm going to do a book. So I've spoken to Jean and Jean's given me some contact. My granddaughter is actually going to be the illustrator. And um, this is a book that I actually I was just saying to Miriam, our admin, this is a book I did 30 years ago. It was when I first done my NNAB, we were asked to do a book. It was part of my assi uh, assignment. It's the same book that I'm now going to actually do and I'm going to get try and get it published. And it's about a bee. I've got I've already got the name of the book, the title. He's, he's Benjamin the Bee. And basically, from doing sustainability, I started to realise and found out that they are the most protected species and they're the most important thing. If we lose the bees, we're in big, big trouble and how important it is. So I wanted to find this book and this book is basically gonna be about this little bee who loses his family. But through that, he, he meets his other little friends and they're all different little creatures. And the children are really loving um, being in the garden. They're liking seeing the worms, the spiders and the mini bees. So all these little insects that they, they're used to, I'm gonna bring them in and they're all gonna have little names and little characters. And at the end of it, they're gonna find, they're gonna help Benjamin find his family. Um, and that will hopefully explain to the children what how important bees are. Um, so, yep, 
that's kind of where I'm at at the moment and hoping to do a little bit more as well as I go on. Wow. Z, that's incredible. June, June, you you, you found that's it incredible. A, that, that, that's what, that's just come from that course. Can you see where yeah, I'm at? It's that's crazy. incredible, Z. Um, really amazing and congratulations and good luck with, with publishing the book. June, I, I do have a few questions um, that have okay. come into us. Is there anything you want to add to um to Z's, Z's comments? No, I think her enthusiasm speaks speaks volumes, to be honest. And I think her, her 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 advice is like one step at a time, people, one step at a time. And you know, don't feel you can change the world overnight, but if you just do one small thing, like if you can improve waste management, if you can improve your recycling, if you can connect with somebody in the community, if you can think about, you know, one thing that you do that in the economic choices that you make, if you can have one menu a week that's vegetarian, you know, anything at all is really your starting point and there's nobody to judge you yeah because we are very judgy these days but so please don't let you know you decide but it's the story of telling the children i think that's so important and they're so up for it fantastic thank you z we need to bottle we need to bottle we need to bottle your enthusiasm and that's incredible so thank you so much for sharing those practical tips with us and um, we've had a few questions so we have um one that's just come in what are some of the biggest mistakes we're making when it comes to recycling oh z do you want to answer that because that that was one of the issues you had wasn't it where in the end you decided to do the recycling center yourself because people were unsure about things yeah i think people are unsure and also um they don't realize how um just doing that one thing can make a massive difference. And I've kind of heard people saying, oh, I know I should, but I can't be bothered. Or I know I should and kind of relying on other people to do it. But it's like, we all, we all, it's all, it's all important that we all do it. And we all, we all, we all contribute because one thing, just doing one thing, like June says, just one thing at a time, slowly recycling is one of the most easiest things that we can do. It's one of the most easiest thing. And what happens is once you start doing it, you start thinking in that way. It becomes like brushing your teeth. You naturally just do it. So when you first start, it, it kind of feels a bit because if you've never done it before, it'll be a bit like, oh, um, you might do it now and again. You might get a bit lazy. You might not want to do it. But once you do it, it becomes so natural. It just becomes a, a lifestyle. And if we all live that lifestyle, I think it'll be a lot easier for all of us. And we'll, it'll be, it'll help. it will help because basically we are destroying the planet. All we can do is prolong what we what is going to eventually happen. That's all we can do. But if we don't do it, we're gonna we're gonna destroy the planet. I mean, a couple of things that we can we can get right is do wash wash the stuff before you put it in the recycling center. Please wash it. Um, and also, when you're making your recycling box, teach the children at the same time so they understand why green is for one thing and, you know, um, blue is for another, whatever colours you choose, but it's best if you use the recycling colours. So that's quite good. Uh, I don't know where you're all from, but um, London has a couple of really good uh, recycling uh, educational centres. There's one over in Wandsworth. Um, and if you take the children on a visit there, it's really interesting for them because it shows them the whole process and stuff. And it's good for you as well because you don't you realise what, what they do. Um, and the other thing is about waste and making good use of your charity shops and, um, re you know, recycling and repurposing things. So I think Z made mention of things like we repurpose things. So rather than, you know, throwing, you know, if the staff insist on bringing bottled water and they have the recyclable bottles, you turn them into, you know, sensory skittles and all that sort of thing. They're all important as well. But it's really about one of the main teaching techniques of an early years teacher you know, one of the art, craft and sciences, narrating. And so I think when you're narrating to the children what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's really quite important. So I think sometimes people see recycling as a thing to do in the corner, but actually, as CZ, if it's part of the way the culture of the of the or is setting and the children are all able to talk about it and you're sort of actively saying, can we put that in the recycling or shall we reuse that? You're introducing that kind of language to them as well. Yeah, that's June, a really good point. Because June, what I did uh, also is um, we made our own recycling boxes. Because I asked Gary, "Oh, can we buy some? Can you buy us some recycling boxes?" He said, "See, 
why don't you make ones yourself? And I thought, a great idea. So all the boxes that our paperwork came in, we just kept them. The children were a part of it. So they actually helped to paint them. We actually designed it. They chose the designs and everything. And we put one in every single room. And they were now responsible for those. And every Friday, no, everything would go in. It was, so we had a paper a recycling um, box, just a cardboard box. And then we'd go around and they would wear their little visors as little recycling people. And they absolutely <laughs> loved it. And they would go around and they would be responsible. And we'd go downstairs and they would put it in the recycling bin. And every Friday, that's what they did. And they, they actually knew why they were doing it because they were now becoming a part of it. And if we introduce it to children very, very early, they will grow up to be responsible adults because it'll be just a part of their lifestyle because it's something that's embedded in them and that's how I've helped them to to, to understand um, especially preschool children they absolutely loved it absolutely loved it fell in love with it thank you Z thank you very much um Maria's just asked <clears throat> if we're in a small village what advice would you give to us here they've got one little shop so I suppose not as accessible to some of the facilities that that we might have in London so um when you when you're in a small village um and um my mother-in-law too recently lived in a small village in Shropshire and we used to visit there quite a lot and one with with one shop you might you therefore have to probably have stuff delivered can you think about your delivery times and that you line things up? I often see people delivering things, you know, four or five different times in the day and the week. And if you can, that's really not that helpful in terms of carbon footprint. So it's like, can you get the deliveries done in one way, in one time? And can you, you know, can you kind of make sure you're not just paying the premium all the time because you need it urgently? Do you really need it urgently? You know, sort of plot those things out. I think that's quite important. Um, it's probably worth talking to the shopkeeper a bit more as well about how you um, you might work in partnership with them because they're getting stuff delivered from Costco and everything else under the sun. And it's a question of, you know, how do you align align with those as well? Um, so to, to understand it, there's some things you can't do a great deal with because of the circumstances, but it's the things around it I think you need to think about. And, it, you know, it is quite grieving that um, we got into a habit of having things delivered. And as a consequence, our, our our country roads are just full of litter and everything else because we've got these people delivering things, throwing things out of their cars and, and you know, moving quite quick. So so I think it's that I'd, I'd start with that, really, and think about how that how do you work with that in, in a small in a small village? You I mean, you've also got the benefits of presumably you've got quite a lot of countryside around you. So it's a question also about connecting with if there are local farms and the likes. And to be able to take the children to see see things like yeah. um, getting the eggs from the farms. And, you know, there's there's a kind of you just what happens, I think, often is you start with a small conversation and then it starts to really kind of get wider and wider. And someone says something and something else. And so it goes on. Um, one of the things that we, that, are, that we all need to be doing, no matter where, where we are, is planting more trees, people. We really need to plant more trees. There's quite a few charities in cities now, Trees for Cities and the Woodland Trust and the likes. But, all, you know, and if we can plant fruit trees, then we can encourage our biodiversity in our gardens. And therefore, we'll have more bees and then we'll have more flowers and we'll have more cross pollination and stuff. So it's it's kind of looking to what you can do in your own space rather than worrying about what we might do in Hackney, which you couldn't do in Hackney, but you could do somewhere else. But what you can do in your village, we couldn't do in Hackney type thing. Thanks. Thanks, June. Um, are there any financial grants to support sustainability or eco friendly initiatives that settings can apply for? Um, I think Z's already made mention of the fact that, you know, your local shops have 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 things. And we certainly applied to Tesco, didn't we, for uh, small grants. We spend a lot of time looking at grants. Um, the DFE are announcing some and they've also announced as part of their strategy, their nature park, which would be quite, quite good ones for the for rural nurseries, actually. Um, it's online. It's run by the Natural History Museum. But it's quite a useful, it's kind of useful space for information and stuff about grants and the likes. Um, there are some, there are small grants, but it's often, as Z said, it's connecting with the local businesses and then them opening up their door to you, really. Thank I you. don't know, Z, do you want to say any more about that? 
Yeah, um, if you just connect with everyone in your local community, you'll be very, very surprised the response you'll get back. You'll be very, very surprised. They're more than happy to work in partnership with us. They really want to work in partnership with us. And it's, 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 it's something that I absolutely, you know, I could sit and talk, talk to you guys all day long about this. I'm just feeling so happy and excited to just be a part of this. And it's so like, it's just so rewarding because there's so many people out there, but if they don't know what we're doing, they won't know how to support us. So it is about going out there, doing a lot of outreach, um, just, just just reaching out and saying, look, this is what we do. Um, is there anything that we can do working together? Can we work together in partnership? And together, collectively, we can help each other because we're helping them as well as they're, they're helping us. And we're supporting each other. Um, and together, it's bringing us together as a community. And I found that quite easy to do, I think, also, maybe because in COVID, I was one of the people that was very, very proactive in my community and making sure. So, and I found that very, very helpful. And it's kind of filtered through because I think we've just come from a very difficult time where we was all in lockdown. So I think there is a lot of a morale at the moment that that's that kind of like that spirit of everybody wants to help because we haven't forgotten. It seems like ages ago, but no one's forgotten about what actually really happened. You know, and um, we, we did have to support each other um, and, you know, and businesses were closed down and they've just opened up. So I think people are, are thinking in a different way now. I think people are more proactive. So, yeah, um, just I would say just reach out, just reach out and um, and just see see what's available. And it's take the really children with you. Isn't it? They love the children. Yes. <laughs> don't go on your take own. The, yeah, take, take at least four with children you. with you. <laughs> sat there, yeah, they'll do it for you. The whole people, everybody was like, oh. Lovely children, let's talk to them. So prime them. Once they start saying about recycling, bring, it melts hearts. I was also going to say from from the, certainly from the big chains, so Tesco's and Home Base. I think you said. I mean, yeah. in, incredible. And what great PR for them as well. You know, if they want to get oh, yeah. involved, especially if you take a few a few token children around. You know, um, with you, it's great great publicity for them to know that they're they're helping the community. So that's really good. Thank you, Z. Um, I've got a few more questions here. Um, would it be helpful to create a policy and objectives? Just a thought. That's from from Jennifer to have a sustainability policy, which I know you're, you've you've looked into, June. Yeah, well, uh, Jennifer, I'll just send you. I'll just send you. If you email me, I'll send you ours and show you how to do it. You, it isn't just helpful; it's essential because once it's a part of your governance, then you have to act on it. You know, you can't just talk about it and it can't be dependent on a few interested characters once it's built into your strategy and then it makes sense to you as well, because you can then decide what bits you can do, what bits you can't do, what bits you want to do. Um, and again, it's always a soft, uh, you know, it's a, a, a sort of steady start. So, yes, I will send it to you if you're interested. Thanks, June. Um, from Grasnia, um, could you please give some more examples of what the children use in the room? which they then recycle. We recycle breadstick boxes for junk modelling or milk bottle tops, but there's too many things still getting thrown away. Z, you might you might want to answer that. What I expect you probably use as much as you possibly can. Yeah, we do. We, we, we recycle everything from plastic to cardboard um, boxes to anything. Everything is, is reusable glasses. So we've even had containers where um, we don't even put soil in them. You can put plants. So you can um, put plants in just water. So we've got jars. So rather than throwing away glass, we, we've got I've got loads of little glass jars now. And funnily enough, today I made myself a salad, a Greek salad, and I put spring onions. So at the end of the spring onions, I didn't I didn't throw them away. I've put them in my bag and I've brought them here. I've put them in a glass vase and we're going to grow them because we've got a big sand pit that we're not using at the moment. And I, I've already said to Jean, that's going to be when I came here to Pembroke, that's going to be our allotment. And I've already seen it and I'm like, that's going to be our allotment. I want the children to grow their own vegetables. It's so important for them to grow their own vegetables. Reuse. So you can reuse um, loads of vegetables. You don't have to buy the seeds. Just save them. You can you can save the seeds, but you can always, the, 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 like, the, like I said, like the spring onions, it's just the ends of them. And then what, when, once the roots grow, you can then grow them. So that's a great way. Um, and you're not buying, you're not having to, you don't have to spend. What I've learned about this course is you don't have to spend as much money as you possibly think. Actually, we're saving money. We're saving money. 
by doing this and um, at the moment last week we started so our project for this week is we're doing um, food waste so we're concentrating on that last term I took the children to a beautiful place which is local in my local park and it's a mosaic place they throw loads of like the pieces of mosaic. I used to do mosaic with them years and years ago. And I know the lady that works there, June and, and, and June, sorry, um, Tessa. And I said to her, um, Tessa, so I popped in and I said, Tessa, you know all the, the mosaics that we used to cut? Do you still throw them away? She said, yes, see. And I said, well, I just work up the roads. Can we have them? And you know what? I took the children and they absolutely loved it. It's a beautiful place. And if they had, so we now have loads of tiny little pieces of mosaics that they can use and they use it for art. So they've made beautiful birthday cards for mums, dads, um, family. So there's so many things that we can recycle. Um, and then just ask people, even in your home, if you look at stuff, you can actually just bring that into nursery. And it's saving our budget as well. It means that we don't have to spend so much money on resources because we've got these resources in our households. We've got these resources. I have seen so many times I walk past and you, this, this is amazing. I've got to just tell you this. Um, I'm, I'm going to make chairs as well. OK, at a tires and these are beautiful and they, you can have tires and they look like ladybirds. You paint them and put your plants in it. So these are tires. And I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, because, you know, you can put the tires and you put plants. You've seen that. But the designs, if you Google it and see that the designs are absolutely outstanding. So I've gone past and there's a garage. So I've made friends with them as well. And I've said to them, what do you do with your old tires? And he says, um. Well, and do you know what they actually do with the old tyres? I bet you never guess what they do with the old tyres. They, the old tyres get dumped into the sea. Yeah, they take them because there's no way for them to go. It's rubber. So, but we can reuse them. So they just dump them somewhere. There is no way for them to go. So they actually get dumped somewhere else. And then most of them are chucked in. They're, they're thrown away in, into the sea. So I was like, no, 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 we could use those. And do you know what? There's so much. You can make beautiful chairs out of them you can paint them you can put nice cushions on them in the summertime it will make them so beautiful in your gardens in your nurseries so there's so much stuff that you can reuse um yeah so i would just say try and um just you know what i've what i have found helpful is this stuff that i've i've had these ideas and when i've got these ideas i just google it i google it and just see what's out there and then and then I try and find all the things and all these things I'm getting for free. That's amazing. That's amazing. I can just picture all the local all the local garages and MOT centres now being inundated by people with, with children saying, can we have a chance? See, this is incredible. Absolutely incredible. We have we we are we are getting close to the end. So I do have a couple more questions for you, June and Z. Just you mentioned about um, parents and carers. So talking about partnerships with parents and carers what's the best way that you've found in getting them involved and getting their buy-in to do this because they might be they might be keen um recyclers at home they may not be so how how do you kind of get them get them g'd up and, and involved in the whole recycling and sustainability story um the thing with thing about parents is that the biggest influences on parents are their children <laughs> and so if you know the theory of the nudge principle um then i think you use the children as nudges and i think that's what we do and i'm sure z will give you examples in a minute but you know um for example what to, to answer the the lady other lady's question i've forgotten her name um but you, you, one of the things we did a, quite a lot about is we we partnered with uh other social enterprises so two examples is bike works so we found that a lot of people couldn't afford bikes bicycles and you know how children grow out of bicycles quite a lot and then our nurseries now lend bicycles on weekends to encourage people to take their children to the park and the likes so that's one way and it's 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 just part of the way we kind of in a way we repurpose things and stuff um and the second thing is uh be careful with tires by the way because they cost 60 quid at each to get rid of and now you're telling me that they go to the bottom of the sea that is some that is a campaign we need to be pick, picking up because that's bad yeah. news um so the 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 other thing is um we work with an organization called fashion enter who's based in leicester london and wales and she uses what they call end of role because 
I don't know if you realise, but the fashion industry is the most wasteful industry in the entire world and has the biggest carbon footprint. And so they use what they call end of roll fabric. So that's normally just dumped, but they make for us our sheets, um, our aprons, um, uh, the children's aprons, um, you know, tablecloths, cushions, whatever you want. And it's end of roll. So it's much cheaper, but it means that it's not wasted. And they use a printing mechanism. So if say you wanted your school title printed or, you know, your, your, your logo on it. They use a printing method that involves no water because most printing involves a lot of water. And actually, so it's very wasteful. And now they use one without any water. So there are like, I think these point is there are organizations that are um, doing really interesting things that help you to make you know choices about what you want to do and how you want to do it and like getting to know what goes on in your local charity shop is really important because it has to fit in with your pedagogy though people because our pedagogy is all about um real experiences for the children um and so like having tea parties is a daily thing and they have proper teapots and they have tea bags and they have mint tea and then whatever z is growing they'll have that in tea and all of those things these are important we have real vegetables in our role play area we always do because sensory learning is much better if it's real but we put it in the fridge at the end of the day and you know big root vegetables last for quite a long time and stuff and, and nobody's choked so i think there's you have to think about your own pedagogy too what is possible for you what you can do and i think when you tell parents that and you explain it to parents and you have planning meetings with parents they really get it so they, you're explaining the learning for the children, which they're interested in, and the children are pushing you to behave differently. Like, mummy, we must walk one more bus stop, you know, that kind of thing. The children, they come back, and I know a parent came back, and it comes back, and I heard there was one not so long ago, and she's, what is this about spillage? You know, she said, she's on me all the time about spillages and about, you know, cleaning up and not wasting stuff. And, you know, they are. So I think your children are a great advocate and I think parents want the best for their children. And so if they think that the decisions they're making now are going to make a chance that those children have a longer life, you know, a happier life and stuff, you kind of catch them, you know, in that emotional moment when they look at the big, you know, the big eyes of their little three year olds and they think I have to I can I must do something positive here. So I think it's it's articulating it. And I think to, to Z's point, when you go on the training program, you're more able to explain things in a kind of natural pedagogical conversational way, as opposed to in a more formal way. So I think it's that too. And it's telling the story all the time and then informing the children who go home and say, mommy, look what I've made. I've made you perfume. I've made you perfume today, mommy, from all of the petals that we got when we went on the high street. And, you know, it's and they go back with a bottle and, you know, it's been recycled and it's made their perfume and you know all of that sort of stuff so it's it's the, and you, and you get better and better at this all the time because the more you do things you think and so, and you, that's why we need a community of practice because when we're all talking to each other someone says and i did this and i did that and i made a frame out of that and i went to the framers and they gave me all these frames for nothing and we've made this amazing collage uh you know it's that kind of conversation and that's why a community of practice is so important because it gives you confidence but also you share brilliant ideas about practice Talk, talking about community, um, June, uh, Kyla and Jill. Hi, Kyla and Jill. Nice to see you. Um, I don't know if we have anybody else in Leicestershire here, but talking about that kind of um, subject, if anybody wants tyres, we have lots that we want to get rid of. We have contacted a company that recycles them and then reuses them for play areas. But this comes at a cost. We are in Leicestershire. So um, if anybody re wants to reach out to Kyla, and Jill, they um they are on this on this thread, so that would be quite interesting. But these takeaways from today, emotion for sure, absolutely, is a real key point. And um, resourcefulness, getting out there, you know, getting to the local Tesco's, as to the big the big ones as well as as well as the small ones. Um, we have had some amazing comments. Um amazing comments on this thread um if anybody's got any last minute questions please please post them or or raise your hand and if not we'll um we'll probably wrap up this webinar it's been so engaging and so incredible so informative thank you so much Z yeah can i can Jean. i have one last moment and yes say, of course you can um, i'm going to make a, i'm going to be very stereotypical here now but i'm going to say that quite a lot of women like bags and the best bags are made by a company called Elvis and Cressy, and they're made from old recycled 
fire fire hoses. So the, the hoses the firemen use when they're worn out, they used to waste them. Now they make the most amazing bags, belts, um, wallets and stuff. Now I don't work with them. There's no way, yeah, but I love the fact that they are really good bags and you are recycling, you're recycling this and you know their hoses because the number is down the side of the bag, it's disappeared. Um, <laughs> But anyway, could you, could you so just repeat, just, there, there is just fun that? things to treat yourself with. You know, every now and then you need a little treat and a bag is a good treat. So if you're going to buy a bag, don't go for some designer thing that everyone has, you know, because you want to look like a celebrity. Go for socially sustainable bags and buy one that's made by people like Fashion Enter or Elvis and Cressy and build a brand around sustainability. June, could you just repeat that, the brand, the bag brand, so I can put it in the thread? It's called Elvis and Cressy. Elvis, as in Elvis. <laughs> yeah, as in, yeah. Hound dog. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And K R E S S I E. Perfect. Wow. My mind, my head is my head is brimming with with ideas. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to June. Thank you to Z. It's been absolutely incredible. Don't forget to join us next month on our April webinar, um, which is all about um, creating and being able to create a toolkit for an all inclusive literacy curriculum uh, focusing on special educational needs. So the, re the, uh, the registrations will be open this afternoon for that. Um, lots of insights. There's been there's been an awful lot of comments. So take a couple of minutes to read those. But thank you both again, and we look forward to seeing everybody next month. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Z. Very thank brave. Thank you so much. Well Bye -bye. done. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.